Hello, welcome back to another week of the DP World Tour Picks and Bets. Skylar Hoke here, Tom Jacobs is there as well with us. This is the show where we pick second place finishers on the DP World Tour. Five weeks in a row, Tom. I don't even know if I can discuss yesterday's round with Gavin Green because that that was Max Payne. I mean, if you can't, I don't know what I can do. Like this, this is literally my fifth in a row. I mean, uh, I just said to your fair, like if he was going to miss it, at least just miss it. Like don't just tease me and, you know, just tickle my senses with a chance of it going in. Like, I mean, come on. It was, uh, he didn't really play well enough in the final round to really deserve it, I don't think. Like he was a little bit errant, should we say, off the tee, uh, which is Gavin Green's style of play. Um, uh, I mean, Max Keith was... A long overdue winner, to be fair. But, but like it uh, was, it was all short game. I'm mean, first in around uh, the green, first in putting. I mean, that's like, as to, but I, I guess we got we got lucky the fact that it was only 54 holes. You probably well, that was the thing. Six. Like, yeah, yeah was, like I think he probably wouldn't have been contention in Sunday if we if we went to you know we had Saturday's round. So in one sense, I think we had a good chance, uh, basically because of the the short and thing. But you get that kind of luck going your way. And I guess that was, that was enough for us. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the, the second place uh, thing is, is alive and well, and looking at my card, I mean, I actually think I deserve to finish second this week. So, um, you know, it's, it's probably gonna happen again. But shout out to our fearless leader, Pat Mayo, who of course had, had his boy Kiefer with Gavin Green on the card. So a little one, two for Mayo pretty easily there. It's good for him representing uh, the DP World Tour winners on Mayo Media Network. Someone, someone's uh, got to do it, haven't they? But so. we, we move on to a, a great week. Arguably the most pleasing week on the eyes that you'll have in professional golf anywhere, I would dare say. Um, Cran Soucier is, uh, you know, the Omega European masters that we have this week, uh, is, is just, it's pure. It's great golf, man. We're up in the mountains, you know, Swiss Alps. It's just, it's just a gorgeous viewing. And we've, we've had some, some great winners, some great finishes, some big playoffs. Um, I, I like this event a lot. What's your thoughts? It's actually probably my favorite event. I know a lot of people like Valderrama and a lot of people like Wentworth and Scott Shope, et cetera, but I really like this event. The the mix of the course and, you know, just some of the jewels we've had down the stretch at times as well. Like, it's just a really fun course to see. Obviously, uh, Rasmus Hoygaard came in with a 63 last year to uh, to put some Ryder Cup places in jeopardy. Um, but but obviously, Wiesberger kind of held on. But that was, you know, that was a tense finish there. And uh, I love it. Like, I think you you look at the the... the um the honor row it's a it's a pretty impressive golf course and gets the best out of you yeah yeah i mean i can vividly you know remember some some really good playoffs i mean what that was like a six for one or five for one the year soderberg won right i think um, there was four playoffs okay. in a row here yeah oh man um yeah this is just a good event i mean it's it's i think it's a really big ball strikers paradise i mean it's a tree line type of course i guess you can't like I, rasmus gives me a little bit of hope that if you can drive it exceptionally well, because I mean, he, he's got a huge driver in the bag, you know, and he still gained significantly off the tee last year, but you know, you have to be a prolific iron player um, this week to, to be able to contend. And we've seen that kind of repeated some low scores out there that 63. Yeah. There um, was some scoring kind of came out of nowhere. Cause Byrne kind of let that one go a little bit. If I remember, I guess yeah, Crocker, I think, Crocker he... might've let it go the most, right? Crocker won. Yeah. Wiesberger definitely. I think he put it, did he put it in the water? And didn't he like? I think eighteen like, was bad or seventeen was bad. Yeah, like, I'm pretty sure he put it in the water. Um, yeah. But when you look, actually, so five of the last seven renewals here have been decided by a playoff, and the other two have been decided by one stroke. Uh, so will it beat Matthew Fitzpatrick by one stroke? Hoygaard beat Wiesberger by one stroke, and everyone else has won by playoff. So that's a pretty, you know, unique thing to see i know golf tournaments are always generally quite close and even if they win by four or five strokes it tends to be a bit more uh drama than you think but i mean that's pretty wild yesterday and i guess this is just golf as a whole but and, and that's like a perfect point one stroke literally one stroke or a playoff is, is what it's decided by like yesterday was no bigger example in the game of golf overall and how fickle winning is and how close it is because if, if we talk about gavin green obviously you, you go to the PGA tour. I, I think Cantley's bounce on 17 was for those that were watching. I mean, clears the bunker, maybe by like a foot has a chance to go in. You can hear him say that's go, that's right in the bunker somehow kicks left, throws it to five feet, beats stallings by one. 
you know, like that's, that's as easy as it was. And then if you watch the corn Ferry tour at night, Philip Knowles to a stroke lead going at 18 has 12 feet, three putts, you know, like his first putt. And that happened the year before at Boise with Rye, you know? So like, it's just so thin. That's why I can't get that mad at second place. We're consistently finding ourselves guys that are, are getting there in contention. And that's all, it's a flip of a coin at, at that point. And it's just, uh, it can be frustrating when it doesn't fall your way, but I think the ability to, to get guys in contention is more than, than just, Hey, I, I picked, you know, as yeah. many players as, you, as anybody. I, I, I think, I think when you look back at it and you think, okay, I've had, five with second place finishes in a row and that's probably seven or eight on the season right we've probably had more that's definitely probably harder to do than two or three winners i would say like because they oh, can just yeah. come from anywhere right and that's probably just me trying to make myself feel better because otherwise you know financially it, it just sucks right but um you know i, I think th- what we've been doing and, and the approach we've taken has been really good over the last few months so um, would, would you a winner? I mean, it's pretty fair to say when you have five, you know, I think we say that quite a lot, but when you have five seconds in a row, it's definitely due. Um, so let's get one this week. Yep. Yep. Uh, I'm on board with that. And I would say we get a stronger uh, kind of field than we, what we I guess this, this field pulls it in decently, but better than what we've had in the recent weeks, I guess, leading up. And, and this is kind of, um, I guess I uh, misplayed a little bit um, the schedule when we talked early in the year. We're going to have back-to-back weeks coming up here with no PGA Tour event. So we're going to have Maiden Hammerlin next week. Then we're going to have the BMW PGA uh, Championship. So Wentworth, you know, in, in two weeks without – Wentworth will be the only thing on the schedule that entire week, if I'm correct, from a from a men's golf standpoint, because Corn Ferry Tour will be wrapped up. No PGA. So all eyes on that week um, coming up. So we have some really strong weeks ahead and hopefully some bigger DraftKings contests, um, some more content out there. So uh, again, we always appreciate your guys' support. If you can find us um, at Daily Fantasy Sports Picks and Bets, The Mix. If you're an audio listener, you can find all of our uh, shows on the podcast uh, platform that you like. Rate, review, subscribe goes a very long way, especially as we get into stretch run. Some really big events um, and, you know, the, whether you win on any of the golf tours, it pays out the same. And hopefully it's those big prizes on DraftKings, um, just as NFL is starting, we can get a couple more for, for golf on the Euro side of things. So um, from the top of the board, so I guess what, from an odd standpoint, we have Fox, Maroc, Bob, Rasmus, kind of the top four. Um, I mean, it's good to see some of these guys back uh, playing again. Are you wary of any, any of them, though, as we, we start to bet? Really, no. I think I think with the the foxes and the Moronk and, and you know Hoygaard, we've obviously touched upon like they need to have that final round sixty three or the third round sixty three or whatever because they've overpowered the golf course. Um, the skill set I don't think lends itself uh, to necessarily performing well here. And you know, let's not take away the fact that Moronk's finished twenty seventh on his debut. Fox has had ninth, thirtieth place finishes, and you know Hoygaard's obviously won. McIntyre I've kind of purposely left out because I just don't know what Robert McIntyre is anymore. Like, I don't don't know if he knows what he is anymore. He's kind of, feels like he's just floating. Like, for sure. I don't know. Feels a little bit like Wilson in a castaway. But, um, you know, it's, yeah, I don't know. I I think you're always going to be wary of people of this talent, but I wasn't this week, which is, you know, pleasantly surprising because it boosts the odds of everyone else. I mean, even these guys are a part, are, aren't immune to a, a DP World Tour Sunday. Like that's yeah. when Perez got his win. It was it was due to to Fox falling. You know, when Marat got his win, it didn't look clear until the last four holes. Like, I don't know if there's anybody that could tee it up outside of like Rory. You know, like I guess we'll see we'll see bigger guys at Wentworth, but like that that is like okay, I am like truthfully scared to, to place anything outside of the I, think, I guess like when you get Hatton and Fleetwood in the desert at certain times if they're on form you'd be a little bit wary of them but otherwise like you say that there's so many people now that have dedicated themselves to the the PGA Tour and the other one that like you know it just it they're, they're just not the fear factor there anymore and I think that's a really good thing for the middle tier guys right I mean you know, Danny Willett's very short in the betting and he's got a you know a fabulous record here, but I wouldn't be scared of him in, in current, you know, circumstances. I'd much rather back Danny Willett in three or four weeks' time, whatever it is, when the Dunhill Links comes about and he's missed a couple of cuts since. Um, 
and then you get like Armitage and Mansell and you know we've, we've said all we need to say about those people on the podcast of late so yeah I'm not too worried I thought we nailed the Mansell uh solo second bet um as we talked about it last week he just fit the bill but once again contention struck he, and... he, he, he by the way he cannot win <laughs> like he's just he's... Gonna, the last time you made that specific of a statement Richard Bland was our winner so yeah, that's true um, yeah Good yeah. luck to Mansell. Good he luck looked, to he Mansell. got a better number this week. 40s is better for him. But I do start my card here. And like, again, I, I focused on the iron play leading in. And I think the best ball striker right now, and I mean, he's backed this up for like a significant stretch of time. Um, you know, if you look at kind of the last 20 rounds on the DP World Tour, has yet to lose strokes on approach since uh, June um, as Antoine Rosner. Rosner here, um, literally cannot buy a putt but his iron game is is exceptional i mean last week leading the field uh you know he he managed a 13th place finish while losing you know over four strokes on the greens um so i i think getting there and hoping it flips again there was nothing that showed if, if yesterday was as perfect of example of how golf can be so crazy. Nothing showed that Kiefer was going to chip and putt with the best of them. Ben had a tweet yesterday, Coley, about those not matching anywhere near his season numbers, you know, and, and that happens sometimes with the flat stick. And we've seen it pop for Rosner in the past. He was a really good putter in June and July at the BMW in the Irish Open. Like he's not immune to having, you know, a, a big putting week. I mean, obviously he's, he's a winner last year. Um, and then, uh, tw- you know, in 2020 at the end there too. So I trust Rosner a lot and really love that trending iron game. I think forties is very favorable. He played really well here, finished 13th, um, last year, again, struggled mightily on the greens was one of the best ball strikers in the field that week. So forties for Roz. Um, I, I know he's a fan favorite from many. I, I'm definitely going in there. He was, he was one that I found a little bit tougher to leave out. Um, and I did leave him out, but final round 62 here last year. So I actually beat that final round of, of Rasmus's and that kind of shows what he can do here. And, and to your point that like he, he struggled with the putter and then still managed to finish 13th is because it finally clicked on one day. Right. And you then say, well, can he just split what he probably gained on the greens on Sunday throughout the week? And he'll probably be okay. So it is tough, right? I think it's like when someone's hit the ball that well and, and the guy that I'm going to come on to next is exactly the same. Um, you are. You're just. You're just hoping it's going to happen. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I have no negatives on on Rosner, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it pairs up very well um, with with the golfer you're going to talk about. You can go into him right now. Yeah. So Romain Langask is just a guy that should have won this season, I think, and and that's not. I don't think too too big of a stretch to say that. Like, you look at his last eight events, eight straight made cuts, eight, seventh, fifth, fourteenth, and I think there was another top finish there somewhere um you know he was second after day one last time out eighth after day two and you know you just look at his record here and he was the 36 hole leader in 2016 he he shot a second round 63 uh, and then he was 48th in 2019 but he shot middle rounds of 65 and 67 and just you know bookend 72s just really killed him I and mean, he was 14th after 54 holes there so was always playing catch up after day one and and kind of left it too late so Sunday, he probably tries to force things. But, you know, he sits third in tee to green and 12th in approach the last couple of months as well. So to me, I think just like the Rosner thing, really, it was one of, you know, one of the other, basically. And uh, and, and I landed on Langask. Yeah, I think incredibly fair and could see. I mean, he has been, I'd put them in the same category in regards to their ball striking this, this yeah. entire season, pretty much. Um For me, I think as we go down kind of the way the cards shook out, um, how should we talk this? Let's go. Do you want to go the Italian boys? What do you think? Yeah, let's I do it. Let's, let's do the Italian let's, boys. And shall I, shall I, shall you, I lead you off? Lead, you lead us in. Maybe we throw a flag over you too for this pick. Here. Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, let's, let's, let's get that thing in so our producer there can uh, cut that one in. But um, look, he didn't hit the ball as well last week, Renato Paratore, but He's been trending. We've kind of spoken about it. He he was kind of 150 to 1, 120 to 1, 80 to 1, now 40 to 1. I think he was basically 50 or 60 to 1 last week, right? But, you know, he's now coming back to a golf course where he's been 24th, 7th, 12th, and 7th, uh, either side of three missed cuts. And he was a 54-hole leader here last year as well, which was probably the last time he really had a chance to really win. So, 
Um, coming back to a goal course, I think, you know, his irons weren't great last week, but probably a little bit skewed by the fact you miss a round. You don't know if they're going to grow into the event. Also, um, maybe not the most suitable golf course, you, even though he'd had sort of course form there as well. So now coming into one where it does really suit him, uh, I like Renato Parasori. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it makes sense with with the lead-in form, with, I guess, the combination. I guess, and it's it's similar to, he probably benefits not not being as driver happy, I guess, because you can probably that, take there. That's my thought, that like, if you... If you're taking, if you can club down because of the altitude and things like that, like, and that's his weak, like, it's no doubt about it. Like, even when he was in contention the last couple of weeks, like, he, his driver was off the course sometimes. So, yeah. um, I think that's a great point that that one I should have made. But yeah, well, that's that's like the wonder of golf statistics that I would love to be able to get more club data because, like, in some ways, those that are like Rosner, if if his irons are this good, like right now instead of using his off the tee numbers, like potentially if he's taking iron off the tee on just say half 12 of the holes, like maybe using his lead in off the tee form isn't as good as what it could be. And, and I think that same yeah. argument needs to be made for the one and only Guido Migliazzi. <laughs> I mean, Guido is getting back in the field here. Life. I mean, like I told you, I would have been okay if he won the last time he teed up because he was like thirties, maybe 40, maybe in, in a field, he didn't deserve that number, but guess what he did time. He finished top 20. Yeah. Top that's his third top 20 in his last seven events that's if, if if i'm coming you saying that after we believed guido you know was was gone from the game of golf you know I, i'd i'd be shocked and, and here we are comes into a course it's got a seventh place finish in the past two rounds of 66 or better and his irons were the best irons we had seen out of him the last time he teed it up now strokes gained from that event i will say we have no idea the accuracy or kind of the comparison of what it could be but for him, it did look like, and I, I follow the shot tracker religiously for Guido. You know, I can barely sleep the days he tees it up. So to get him at a place he's comfortable, at a place where maybe he can take the driver out of the bag because the driver was not great. But we see the best in the industry, in my opinion, putting him up this week. Ben Coley and Bradley Todd, both on him because of the upside we know he possesses at familiar courses. I think the tree line nature of this course does have some comparisons to Karen country club in which, you know, he was a winner there. Um, Langas also has played well there too. So I like that kind of the angle there, but uh, yeah, I just, I feel better with the shot this week on him at a number that is bigger than what it was. Cause I think he can win with the best of them, you know, on his best. He's one of those type of golfers um, and he's done that, you know, so I don't think there's any surprise there. Um, trying not to be super emotionally attached to this selection, but we need a winner, Guido. We could use it. I'm not, you know, when I first looked at it, I kind of felt that like he was a bit too short again. And then when you kind of outlined the fact that he's had three top 20s in his last, what do you say, seven starts, and you're actually giving him one less round of 66 or better. He had two on his debut bookend, yeah. uh, 65, 66, and then he had one last year as well. Uh, yeah, one last year as well. He finished with 65. He closed it with it, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he, you know, he was sixth after day one um on his debut and finished with a 66 and he comes back last year closes with a 65 after opening with 67 like he he can clearly play this golf course very well and one thing we do know about guido is that you know if he's showing a bit of life he can go back to the golf course if he likes yeah i feel good about that one that's scary that's that's pretty scary i mean i don't have to i don't have to have the talk with you this week so it's probably a good thing yeah i mean you might be in on it that's that's kind mm, of yeah, maybe Mm-hmm. Yeah, could be. Um, I'm going to roll back to back here. Um, I think it makes sense because, yeah, because your guys are a little bit longer. Um, so we have two golfers at 66 to one here, best numbers. Two golfers back to last week. The two most popular selections across the industry were Gavin Green and Wilco Nienaberg. I think they delivered as good as you could have really wanted them to without a victory. Who knows what Sunday would have brought for if there was an additional 18 holes? Wilco's, I, I would dare say the the irons he had on Friday and Sunday is the best stretch of 36 hole irons that Wilco has had in his career. Is that sustainable? As our friend Axis would ask me, because he did this morning when I said that to him, he said, no chance. But you know what? Rasmus kind of deployed a, a little bit of a different type of mold to take over this course. Of course, Rory has been exceptional when playing here too. That's a big stretch to say for Wilco Nienaber. But with the driver in the bag if he is going to play this course differently than other golfers or give himself such better iron looks from even uh, a hybrid or a you know a lower iron off the tee 
I think he just possesses the skill set that I loved what he showed last week. I don't want to go away from that. The number also somewhat even tripled in some markets. He was as low as 28 when they teed off, you know, in, in a lot of spots. So to get him at 66s, I think is nice to go back to the well. And there's not much more to say about Gavin Green outside of he played excellent, missed, you know, play. We needed nine more good holes and, and, and he wins last week and he's near the same number, you know, yeah. I, I think you just, I go back right to the well with it. So Wilco has had a second round 63 here in the past. So again, just like Rasmus, just like uh, Rosner, just like Fox, you know, people before him can just flash for a really low one here. And it depends what he does before that round happens. Um, the course is clearly just susceptible to having a low one if, if people just get their drivers right, right? And, you know, I think he's a good player, definitely at the better price this week than he was last week. He definitely got to uh, a ridiculous number last week. But going into Gavin Green, really hard not to pick him again this week. And possibly I might just back him in the first round leader market just to give myself some sort of look. I thought we had it. I, I did thought we, we had, had it. it. I know. But what did he have? Two eagles and like five birdies and still... <laughs> Didn't yeah. finish first round leader. Yeah, whatever. Um, he had, he shot a uh, sixty three here on his debut on the Saturday. Uh, he opened with 65, 64 to lead at the halfway stage in twenty nineteen, and then last year when he was thirty second, he still shot second round sixty five as well, Gavin Green. So, really good data uh, there, and you know he's he can't argue with his form. So I think the price is basically based on the fact that what he did in that last hole, which yeah. actually was a lip out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 100%. I mean, it's as good as you could have like lined things up from a selection from like a full on industry. So, I mean, everybody and their brother was on him last okay. year. And I mean, good, good on him. You know, I mean, I think he can come back. That's, that's for him. That's two weeks in a row. That's happened. You know, like he, he could have won. He had a shot on the 72nd hole on the Asian tour the week before. So does that melt you? Or does it break you through? We'll we'll see here. So um, tee it up to you here. We mentioned former winners um, or former playoffs. Here's a here's a winner here uh, in the home area. Yeah, so um, kind of first of all, before I go on to this pick, I thought Ewan Ferguson was actually a bit of a big price at 50 to 1. Like, you know, this is a guy that I think basically because he's coming in as a winner that he's getting penalised as opposed to actually just looking into the fact that he's got really good form and play well. At, you know, you mentioned Karen Country Club. I'm pretty sure that was where he had a chance to win before... Uh, before melting it might have been the other one i can't remember now but um yeah he was definitely um playing well there so he's someone i think is a decent price but on to my pick sebastian soderberg um best paris 80 to one over here hit his approaches well last week like he was sixth in approach going to dp world tour based on his two rounds before he missed the cut obviously um former winner here as you mentioned beat rory McIlroy in that playoff um which i always just hold on to as Sebastian i say every single time but it was Rory McIlroy, Lorenzo Gagli, Andres Herrera, and Cali Samoya. So, decent bunch of golfers, right? Um, and if I hadn't seen anything from him, then I would just say, look, I'm, I've kind of steered away from this kind of course uh, form sort of stance on things. But you look at the fact that he was, um, you know, just playing really well. And he was ninth at the halfway stage when he, you know, played uh, well here last year as well and shot 74 70 over the weekend to kind of drop down. But you look at his last few results and it paints a bit of a bad picture, but 53rd at the US Open, he was 31st at the halfway stage. That's pretty respectable. He was 46th at the Irish Open, but he was 4th at the halfway stage. He was 47th at the Scottish Open, but he was 29th at the halfway stage and shot a 67 on the final day to bounce back from this 76 as well. And he was the open of a 69th at the Barracuda, shoot 29th, uh, 6, 29th in the stroke play department as well. So just been flashing really good rounds, like one or two rounds here and there. Um, and like I said, uh, you know, when he came back to defend it two years after he actually won it, um, he, he was right there over the, the halfway station inside the top 10. So really likes this golf course. We know he's dependent on golf courses itself. And yeah, I like it. Yeah, I, I can definitely get behind um, there. And you know, I just think back to that playoff. Andres Romero, this, this is what I kind of laugh a little bit about. And we'll get, kind of get into selections and somewhat a little bit later, but, um, or, or I guess the, this conversation, but the repeat invitations that the, the DP world tour gives to some guys, like I'm betting a 400 to one shot who's, you know, we'll talk a little bit later, but like, it's like their third or fourth time, you know, like you can guarantee at the Omega masters, Andres Romero is going to be playing here for the next 30 years. He might not, he, I don't think he has a card anywhere. Like he might be on the Latino America tour. And, and he well, might have a body suit if he keeps coming back either. That's hey, the thing. He might, but he'll, we'll wake up Thursday morning. He's like 400 through seven. Like that's what he does. <laughs> he gets hot with the putter, but, um, 
if I think back to one of my favorite, when, I guess when I started betting DP World Tour, there was one guy specifically that when the numbers first came out, it was like, holy cow, this guy's the greatest golfer I've ever seen in my life. And this event specifically, it ruined me. It ruined me when, when Bjergaard lost to Fitzpatrick in, yeah. in 2018. Like that, that Sunday 63, I mean, just ball striking it like crazy, had himself some chances uh, to win that playoff. Um, I think it might, might have won a couple of I think Fitz had a decent putt to win. But man, Bjergaard showed probably the best overall game he has had the last time out in in a good amount of time what's crazy to think is that year he had three top 25s i guess the year after in in majors i mean you remember masters he was there i mean pga championship at beth page hole in one you remember he had like it was some some cool scenes for beer guard at the peak of his game um and we really haven't seen and i think you were on it decently was that last year was that early this year when he showed a couple flashes and then it was like an 18 hole thing where he was in the mix and he would just fall back. That I think it was last year, right? Because yeah. I think he was at the, um, he showed some life at the ISPS hander where we don't get the, All the numbers, the, yes. the numbers, right? And I said that, you know, I'm just going to back him hoping that, you know, that he has played well off the tee and, and approach and I can't really prove it. And then he came back and played well. And I don't know where he actually finished that week now, but you know, he, he played well and then I think he sort of went into the Portugal Masters and things like that as well. And it looked like he was going to sort of run it off and look like he could win again at some point last year. Um, and then, you know, came crashing down this season before third last time out. Yeah, I mean, that that Kazoo Open graded by Data Golf is the second best performance he has had since the 2019 Open Championship. Um, you know, he did have that T2 um, at the Portugal Mount Masters that you brought up. And that was led by a little bit more of the putter. I mean, this this time out, he was very strong in all assets to the green. Um, and we love that. And, and I think it's hard to say because maybe it's a feel thing or just an eyeball thing, but it does feel in ways that guys have reproduced success here, potentially more than other type of courses, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, it was just like, a natural fit leading into showing some life and going to a place where he's got good vibes and, and good memories of us backing him um, there. So I definitely would triple digits for him. He opened like 150 here and immediately slashed to 100, but 100 still the best number, but definitely in on beer guard. Yeah, I think it's whenever you see a little bit of sign in life, it's like all of them. Like we've seen it with Paratori recently. We saw it with Andrea Pavan last year. We saw it with, you know, many a golfer, Crocker before he won. Like, when you've seen what their benchmark is and then they they play poorly for five or six weeks, go out to a big price, and then they and then bang, they show something. Yes, their price does get cut dramatically because of name factor and things like that, but it's also warranted. And I don't think he's actually come in as short as I expected him to based off that third place finish. I know he's he's you know best price 100 to one, it's kind of 1980 to one, but I kind of could have seen him in the 66 to one range, you know, in that range, you've got like Nacho Elvira and, you know, Scott Jameson doesn't win. I like Scott Jameson and think he could go well, but, you know, just, just to name a few in that area, Eduardo Monari, I mean, is he ever going to win again? Like it's, it's, you know, he should probably be in that same range of those guys. So uh, yeah, I like it. I think it's good. And he's another guy that leads in well to kind of my next pick as well. Yeah. I think we just go, let's close out with our two selections here um, as the clock's ticking a little bit. Um, cause I think you can get lost a little bit in these deeper triple digits. Um, yeah. here, and, and maybe it's easy to say that cause we like betting those golfers often, or I do yeah. specifically, yeah. I do, <laughs> but, um, it almost killed me when Bobby Bay, uh, you know, he's, <laughs> he's in the irons really well and he's probably someone's keep an eye on. Yeah. Um, who are you in at? So I like Tom Lewis. Like I said to you last week that he was kind of on the radar and I had nothing to really back it out. Right. Like he hadn't played for a long time. Didn't know what he was going to do. He, he'd shown life at that course before, but wasn't sure but he's now warmed up with a 13th place finish in Prague tw uh, top 23 in approach and tee to green and improved as the rounds went on so probably don't know what he would have done in the fourth round as we mentioned with a couple of guys um chances him here because he's been 13th and 20th um on two uh, two of his four starts and the last time he was here he shot a final round 65 which is his best round so I think just that bit of life that he's shown I think the rededication to the the, the DP World Tour potentially coming up uh really like Tom Lewis at 100 to 1 um and ash and woo at the same sort of price as well yeah he, he's in that like no man's land um of like status you know yeah. like it's a weird 
I almost feel um, uh, Wallace is teeing it up this week. But like Wallace was 126, I think, on the number. And like, I assume, when's the last time Wallace won on the DP World Tour? Was it 19? It might have been 18. Yeah, 19, I think it was. Did he? Okay. Nope, 18. 18. Like, okay. he's, right outside, he's outside the number on the DP World Tour right now. Yeah. Like, it's just a weird in between for some of these guys. And Lewis found himself in that spot. And if you remember, one of the Corn Ferry Tour finals right now, one of the greatest performances, I would dare say, in that moment in Corn Ferry Tour finals was Tom Lewis getting his tour card after not playing the first two Corn Ferry events and going yeah. out and winning the last one and not even winning, winning in style. Like, he just blitzed everybody. So he has that in the bag of tricks. I like that. I'm going to join you on Tom Lewis. I almost wanted to bite the bullet on Lee Slattery. I don't know if Slattery's got enough. The place number is probably pretty good being around there. Um, but because he's, he's 125 ish um, yeah. in that same realm. But I'm going to go with Jeremy uh, Freeberghus. Yeah, I think that's fair. Freeberghus. Yeah, that sounds Freeberghus, I would say. But, you know, who, you know yeah. tomato, tomato. So he was the one I was talking about, 400 to one. Um, so he opened, didn't open on. Uh, 365 open on DraftKings at 400s. I think it's still hanging. Um, on, the, on the books that have it each ways here, he was like 100. I, I think you'll probably find the middle. Maybe you get him like 250. Um, yeah. But it's a simple fact. Again, we're, we're seeing challenge tour guys. We're seeing Corn Ferry tour guys. We're seeing a lot of guys getting step up in elevation, competing early and often. He's got a decent repertoire. He's a little bit older than like, I guess he's 26. Um, but like the simple fact, he's the fourth best player in the challenge tour right now, fourth in ranking. He doesn't have a win yet this year. Uh, comes off a of T2 last week. Uh, he was ninth two weeks prior to that. He had four other top 10 finishes. Again, consistent in the manner of, of getting into the fourth place finish. He did well on the challenge tour the year prior. Um, he had two wins on the pro golf tour in 2020. Um, as an amateur, he was racking up a few wins. I believe he had one in 16 and one in 17. Um, and he has seen the course in, in the kind of like remark of somebody that keeps getting invited. These guys near the bottom, like get invited. Like he had two invites as an amateur in 17 and 16, didn't do anything with it. Um, and I'm not worried about that, but um, I think overall, you just bet that talent and, and I guess at least a little bit of familiarity with the course at, at a number that just, if the fourth place guy on the Corn Ferry Tour was playing on the PGA Tour, I don't think he's 400 to one ever. You know what no, I mean? But when I looked at him, he played four rounds here, obviously missed two cuts, but he shot a 68 on his final round that he played here. And that's the most recent data we've got, right? And when you think about the fact he's obviously improved a lot, um, I thought he was really good. And then just, just one more for me was Ross McGowan, who Ooh, is as big yeah. as 300 to one over here. He's 25th recently at the Kazoo Open, where he was 11th at the halfway stage. And in five starts here, he's finished third, fourth, and seventh in those five starts. And he's been inside the top five during eight of his 18 rounds on this golf course. So a bit of a core specialist, uh, big price. We know he can win uh, at big prices. So I thought he was worth throwing in. Yeah, I think overall, man. It's a fun week. I really like where our card's set up. Even though this, the alignment isn't on the exact guys, I think we have a process that we're following. It's pretty similar, some crossover, um, yeah. of course, comps, and just dial it in. And, and we really like this week. And like I said, it's, it's into another good event la next week. I like Hammerlin's event a lot. Fans there are really good. Um, maybe we'll get some dance moves out of some guys. And <laughs> the ducks. They have the ducks, right? Isn't that what they have there? What is the, the things that make them? I think they do ducks. Yeah, but, sounds good to me. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, and then we're going to, to Wentworth. I'm going to start juicing up DraftKings now. See if we can start sending some messages. All, yes, of our, all of our supporters here, send a message to DraftKings Assist on Twitter. Say, hey, we're looking forward to Wentworth. There's no PGA Tour. What about six figures to first? You know, let's give us 100K. We're out here. Yeah. We would like that a lot. We would like that a lot. So, um, but let's review our cards here before we close out. Yeah, so for me, it was Romain Langask is kind of 33 to 1. Renato Paratore, 45, 50 to 1. Sebastian Soderberg, 80 to 1. Uh, Tom Lewis at 100 to 1. And Ross McGowan at 300 to 1, whatever you can get around him. Perfect. I have Antoine Rosner, 40 to 1. The Guido Migliazzi, 60 to 1. <laughs> Gavin Green and Wilco Nienaber, both at 66 to 1. Lucas Biergaard, 100 to 1. I like you with Tom Lewis there. I believe he's 125 here in the States. And then Jeremy Freeberghaus at 400 to 1. We'll get some top 10, top 20 action on him too if the numbers turn out right. Um, but hopefully everyone enjoys yourself. A great viewing week um, this week at the Omega European Masters. And thank you, Tom, as always. Yeah, thank you, Scott.